Good morning, friends. Good to be with you on a rainy Sunday morning. This morning we're, we're going to need a blue hymn book, and we're going to be doing setting three, which is on page 188. 188. But our opening praise is 919. words take us back from wherever we were when we walked in here to the moment that God adopted us into his family. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Top of the next page. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, restore us, according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. 
Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. and defend us, gracious Lord. Please be seated. We have two scripture readings today, and between them will be the psalm. Our first reading, familiar to you all, first book of the Bible, page 3, Genesis 3. We're, we're jumping in at verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid 
from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And the Lord said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You'll crawl on your belly and you'll eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity, that's warfare, between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He, he, will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. The word of the Lord for you. The psalm of the day is number 62, on page 62.
Our Gospel reading for today, the Good News According to Mark, Chapter 3. This is on page 1263, if you're reading along. We're reading at verse 20. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said he's out of his mind. And the teachers of the law, who came down from Jerusalem, said, he's possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons. He's driving out demons. So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand, his end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. I tell you the truth, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them, but Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He's guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an evil spirit. The word of the Lord. The hymn of the day is number 626. Thank you. 
Grace and peace are yours through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. This morning's scripture does not take place down in Jerusalem, down in Judah. It takes place up in Galilee, 75 miles north. If you're going to walk between Judah and Galilee, how long would it take you? 75 miles? How many miles can you walk in a day? If you said, I could do five, then it would take you five times 15 to get up to the shore of the Sea of Galilee. This isn't the easiest scripture um, that a person could read or think about or talk about or try to teach to a, cla a Sunday school class or a vacation Bible school class. This is what happened. Jesus has done a healing. Jesus has done a healing. He has driven a, a demon out of a human being. An unseen hand that moves a person, that presses sound out of them, that convulses them. One time a father came to Jesus and he said, a spirit takes hold of my little boy and many times it has thrown him into water to drown him or into fire to burn him. Jesus had driven out a demon and two groups, two groups with completely different backgrounds challenged him now. The first group that challenged him, you, don't have, you and I don't have any trouble in saying these are the bad guys. The, the scribes, in Greek the word grammar is in their name. The scribes came up from Jerusalem because Galilee was abuzz with talk about this new teaching that came with power. And so the control center down at the temple sent some like being audited by the IRS, I suppose. They sent somebody that you couldn't really ignore. Some of the Bible scribes, those who handled the Word of God and could even tell you how many words and how many letters are in a certain chapter because they copied it out by hand so carefully. And when it became, what's our word? incontrovertible, when it became unable to be denied that Jesus had done this great, this great miracle and had relieved the suffering of a human being, the, the scribes said, okay, we cannot deny this has happened. He's done an impressive miracle. He must get his power from Satan. Isn't that alarming that in the that you're right at the beginning of the good news, the gospel? Isn't that alarming? And you're only three chapters in, and already Jesus is accused of not just lying, not just being an imposter, but um, being in league with the devil. Is, that, is there anything like that in our lives and experience where somebody says, you are so wrong. You are so on the wrong side of history. You are so misunderstanding uh, the message of love in the Bible. We could only draw the conclusion that um, you are devilish. You are the true devils in the world. Is that possible? That somebody could talk like that? Well, we're gonna 
we're going to have a month now of, of Pride Month in America, and I think if your eyes are open and your ears are open, it's an instructive time to see what people think about those who read the scripture as it lies and who understand what it says about God's design for human society and the family. So the scribes said, Jesus is possessed by a demon. He, he has a spirit working in him that comes from the devil. Way surprising is the other group that challenged Jesus. It was his own family. It was Mary and his brothers and sisters. They were from Galilee, right? They were from Nazareth. Jesus, if you, if you do some backwards reading and see where he is, he's in a city on the lake, on the big lake, on the, on the Sea of Galilee, a city called Capernaum. He moved there. He moved there. And he and his, his 12 were in a house, and he was here. Here's a striking sentence. He had healed so many. Jesus had healed so many. You know, we've said before that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I think there are like 35 or 36 miracles that are actually mentioned. But here, it, you're barely into the book, and it says he had healed so many. Remember that when John ends his book, he said, if you wrote down everything that Jesus said and did, I wonder if the whole world would have room for all the books that would have to be written. So he had healed so many, and, and now there's a crowd, a large crowd from Galilee. They came to him, even from outside of Israel. So can we... Just imagine a house, not, not even a room of this size, but can you imagine a house packed full of people, um, living room steps, kitchen overflow, packed. And the word got out that Jesus and the twelve had been so busy, one person after another, one case of misery after another, one heart burdened by sin after another. And they hadn't stopped to eat. Now I'm just going to ask you, is that ever, can you think of a time in your life where you skipped a meal because you were so busy? How about if you were moving and you had help and you said, we're just going to keep going, we're not going to stop for a meal. I think we can understand missing a meal and not eating. So this must have gone on for a whole day or more. And his family, including Mama, heard that her boy was not stopping to eat. And the conclusion that her family drew was what? Can you even make your mouth form these words? This is Mary. He's out of his mind. He's, he's off the rails. He, something has happened to him. Maybe he's a victim of something. We have to... This is just too much. This is too much. So they made themselves the arbiters, the deciders of what God should do and what he was allowed to do. Jesus has the scribes over here and he's got his family over here, both of them trying to stop him. It's, it's very hard to, to believe and it's even harder to apply to ourselves unless you ask yourself, have you ever had this thought that church is just too much, that regular worship is asking too much, 
that if I spent on, on a trip what I spent in my offerings, I could have had a better trip. You know, maybe, that, maybe the claim of his family was really not so far from how you and I think. Uh, this is just too much. They thought he was unbalanced. He was off the rail. It was not godly what he was doing. Jesus says, I have a parable for you. So he stands between both of these groups and he says, if there's a strong man if there's a gangster and he has stolen much and brought it into his house, that stuff and those people that he's in control of, they don't have a hope. They don't have a prayer because they are held by a strong man. He said, only if a stronger one appeared on the scene. Only if a stronger one appeared on the scene, capital S, capital O, only if a stronger one appeared and fought that strong man, that gangster, only if he engaged with him. Only if he tied him up and bound him. Think of someone who the police have put zip ties on their hands and ankles. Only if a stronger one shows up and binds, B-I-N-D, binds the strong man. Does he cease his rule of terror? Jesus in his life, before, years before he ever went to the cross, he was obeying his father day by day. His father was receiving from his son the obedience that he's never gotten from me or from you. Jesus, that's called Jesus, Obedience, his active obedience while he was alive. He had to keep his father's commandments and will all the time. And he always had to yield to his father's will. Submit, we don't like the word submit, but that's exactly the Bible word. The son had to submit to his father's will. And then, when he went to the cross... He accepted the ticket, the bill, the invoice for my crimes against my Creator and against you. So that's called his passive obedience. That's something that was done to him. It's not something he did. That would be active. It's something done to him that's passive. So. Jesus ties up the strong man. You heard it in Genesis 3. When the Lord God spoke to Satan, we, we talked about this last week in reference to the banner. I will have a family, God said. I will have a family, Satan. And in order to bring that about, a child of this woman with whom you have been so friendly, a male child, is going to come down the corridors of time and hunt you down. He will crush your head. He will crush your head. So unless a stronger one comes, Jesus is telling this parable to both parties. Unless a stronger one comes and ties up the strong man, all the strong man's stolen goods remain in his, his house. But if a stronger one comes and ties him up, then the stronger one can take his stuff. 
which is exactly what Jesus was doing person by person as he drove out demons and as he healed the miserable and forgave the sins of the guilty. Robbing souls from the soul stealer. And each of you, it would be good for you when you think of who you are and when you think of your life to say, Jesus has robbed me from the robber. Jesus has stolen me back from the one who had me behind locks and bolts and chains. It's a very simple story, but it's a very good one. Jesus is saying to the scribes, you think Satan, you think I'm invested by Satan, you think Satan is helping me rob souls from your wretched, miserable dictatorship? And then he says to his own family, I think you got the opposite problem. You're too familiar with me, aren't you? You've grown, you've grown tired of me. You think you know me because I grew up in Nazareth. You think that you can't respect me because I share your flesh and blood. And you're here to set me straight. The stronger one has come. It was a rebuke. And when people said, Jesus, your mom and your, your family are outside of the house. They're, they're way, they can't get near you. They want to talk to you. Jesus said, my mother and my brothers and my sisters are right here listening to me. My family thinks that they are privileged, that they don't have to listen to my words. Here's my new mom and brothers and family, those who are gathered around uh, the word of life. Oh my, what a sharp rebuke. When we're tempted to say family is the most important thing, and Jesus says, you'll find my family gathered around the word of life, the law which exposes our, our heritage being a, a slave of Satan, and the gospel which says a stronger one has come and has stolen us back. Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. <clears throat> the Creed, the Nicene Creed, is on page 196. Stand if you're able. One ninety six. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God of God, light of light, true God, true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come. Amen. 
In our prayers today, page 198 in our prayers today, we have a couple. First of all, we pray for our friend and congregational helper, Pastor Norman Schell, whose wife Nadine died and her Christian funeral was yesterday. We pray a prayer of thanks for our sister in Christ, Lorna Cohn, who has served Living Hope for decades as a musician beautifying our worship and helping uh, numerous musicians to uh, take part in our regular weekly worship. And we also pray for um, Carol and Jim Zahn, little note, our brother-in-law, Larry Pomeroy, died last night. He had been in hospice for renal failure. He was married to Carol's sister for 46 and a half years. A Christian, a proud husband, father, and grandfather of five, an Iowa farmer. So we join those prayers together. Father in heaven, we ask that you uh, be the companion in a special way of Norman Schell, who has helped us many times here in Omaha, and who has lost his life partner and is now a widower. We ask in your mercy that you would uh, give him a bright faith in the resurrection of Jesus, looking back and a bright trust in the resurrection of the body of all believers which lies just ahead. We pray today for Lorna, a prayer of thanks, and we, we want you to hear us say thank you for giving us uh, cheerful and skillful and willing, faithful, steadfast musician to beautify our worship all these years. Help us use the gift you have given each of us uh, to build up the body of Christ, as Lorna has. And finally, we pray for the wife, um, Mary Ann, who lost her husband, Larry, and she is Carol's sister. And we ask that you would comfort the family with the word of resurrection to eternal life and the sweet knowledge that um, God puts us in families here on earth so that we are not left all by ourselves. What a, what a great gift it is. And when uh, someone departs this life before we do, we look forward to seeing them again. All those who trusted in Christ as their hope of eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our offering basket is at the door of the chapel. Here's our offering prayer. Father, help me appreciate my identity as your child so that I begin to learn my responsibility as your servant. I'm going to need reminding this week again, Father. You have not called me to live alongside you as an equal, but to live under you as a servant. From week to week, help me joyfully and consistently to devote time and energy, the use of my gift, as well as the daily bread you have placed into my hands, so that I might serve my neighbor in her need, and by doing so, serve you. Amen. We're on 199, the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. <coughs> Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It 
It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns forever in perfect unity with you and the Holy Spirit as one God and one Lord. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Blessed are you, Lord God, eternal King and gracious Father. In love you made us the crown of your creation. In mercy you planned our salvation. In grace you sent your Son to redeem us from sin. We remember and give you thanks that your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, became flesh and made his dwelling among us, that he willingly placed himself under law to redeem those under law, that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on a cross, that he has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Bless us as we receive your son's body and blood in the sacrament. Forgive our sins, increase our faith, strengthen our fellowship, deepen our longing for the day when Christ will welcome us to his eternal feast. Praise and thanks and honor and glory be to you, O God our Father, and to your Son, and to the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's read the Lord's Prayer from the left-hand column today. <clears throat> our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
seated. We'll come to the table now. We'll try to have tables of 10 to 12 people. the true blood of your Savior Jesus poured out on the cross at Calvary for the remission the sending away from you to Jesus of all of your sin. This is the blood of Christ. This is for you. Take and drink the true blood of your Savior shed on the cross for the remission the sending away of all of your sin. This body and blood will strengthen and preserve you in the true faith to life everlasting. So go in peace. Your sin, forgive, forgiven. Remember who you are, a dear child of God on your way home to heaven. Amen. <clears throat> body and blood will strengthen and preserve you in the true faith to life everlasting. Go in peace. Your sin, forgive Dear child of God, on your way home to heaven, amen. body and blood will strengthen and preserve you in the true faith to life everlasting. So go in peace, your sin forgiven.
worship comes to a close on page 203. Please rise. Middle of the page. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, O God, the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you've given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives, reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.